Hello and welcome to Argos Data Block Designer Training. My name is Barb and I'll be leading the training today. The intended audience for this training is the designer. The prerequisites to the training are Argos Report Viewer and Report Writer. Argos data blocks are SQL based. You're not required to know SQL, but it is expected that you understand basic query logic. The material in this class is technical in nature, so we're not going to cover basic definitions. Now, the goal of the training is to demonstrate the functionality available as a designer and how to create a data block. So we're going to be covering the following objectives in this training. We're going to review what the designer role is. And we're going to create a data block, discuss the functions available within a data block, and we're also going to discuss the capabilities available as a designer. OK, um, so to create our reports, there are three things we need. A data block form, the report query, and a report format. First, we have the data block form, and this is where we will narrow our results. Second, the requirements are sent to the database as a SQL query. The query incorporates three things, our search parameters, our criteria, and the list of data elements that we want returned. Now, in Argos, we take the data block form and the report query and we combine them into one object that we call a data block. As a data block designer, we create the data block used by report writers. Now, the dashboard can have a separate query for each object. The report query is the basis for the banded, extract, and CSV reports. Okay. So now we're going to create the data block, and I've already launched Argos and logged in as a designer. So as you can see down here in the bottom right, I'm logged in as the designer. Here's my role down here on the bottom right, data block designer. Here's the name of the server. So the data block we're going to create is the address information data block. It's the same data block we've been working um, with in the report viewer and report writer classes. It's a simple data block that returns basic name and address information. And it also contains both a form query and a report query. So to create our data block, you just go to the folder where you want to put the data block and click on the data block icon under the tabs. Or you can right click on the folder and select new data block. <clears throat> so I'm going to put it in the designer folder. And here you see we have our new data block. Um, so now that I have the new data block, I'm going to give it a name and a description. We do recommend that names and descriptions be as descriptive as possible. So I'll name this one <clears throat> Pardon my cough here, I'm uh, getting over a little bit of a cold. Okay, and now also I do want to add a description here. I'm going to say this is OK to delete later. And as you see, that comes up here. Now, the data block must be assigned an ADO connection to the database. Now, this is the connection that the users will use to run their reports. If you choose a connection pool, so what you do is click on this drop down right here. Um, if you choose a connection pool, the users will be given a choice which connection to use when they run their reports. Pools are very useful when you're testing because you can easily test against different connections without exiting the design window. For purposes of this demo, I'm not going to select a pool. I'm just going to select a direct connection. I'm going to connect to a banner database. 
So I'm just going to choose training eight. And now I can click on edit to design the data block. So as you see, we have three tiles here, reviewer, writer, and data block designer. So under data block designer, I'm going to click edit. And uh, this is the data block design window. Um, so let's do a quick review of its features just before we do anything. Here we have commit. It's not bolded right now just because I haven't done anything. I haven't made any changes that need to be saved. Um, this allows you to save your changes. And then we have close. Close allows you to exit the design window. There's also the active connection um, drop down. So if I had not assigned a connection in the data block detail page, I could choose a connection here. But the association would not be saved. And once I close this window, I, again, I would have to um, choose the connection every time, <clears throat> which is it's kind of a hassle. Then we have, <clears throat> excuse me, the play icon right here, which is our test button. I can test all my changes from within the data block design window. And then we have the web view button, which allows you to test your data block in Argos Web Viewer. In order to use the web view button, all pending changes have to be committed first. Here we have our tabs. Um, so below that, we have the form design tab and the report query tab. In the form design area, we have three more tabs. Uh, we have the Forms tab, the Properties tab, and the Variables tab. So on the Forms tab, a data block can have more than one form and use multiple variables to link from one form to another. Properties is where the properties of an object are defined. And Variables, the Variables tab lists all my variables contained um, in the data block. So here we are on the Forms tab, and um, we're going to get started creating the form. The first objects we're going to add are images. And to do that, I'm just going to click on the Add Image button, which looks like a picture right here. You click on the uh, Image button and then click on the form. And as you can see, you're given three options from which to retrieve the image. You have images stored in the data block, images stored on the server in an accessible location, and image will be retrieved from a variable. So I'm going to choose the first option and click Browse. And I just want to make sure I'm in the right spot here. Okay. Okay. And click open. Now, um, with the image still selected, you want to make sure that the following properties in the properties tab are set because this is going to be my background. So I'm going to go over here to the properties and next to align, I want to change this to client. I'm going to stretch it. I want to make the top zero, make sure left is set to zero. <clears throat> and auto size, no, perfect, okay. So uh, I also want my logo on this page as well. So to do that, I'm going to click on Add Image uh, again, and I'm going to drop it in here. Again, I'm going to browse to it and just grab my Argos logo. And I want to... Um, change the, obviously this is cut off, right? So I need to change the properties. I do see a few people have um, joined the web session since I started. Just to give you a little heads up, I will be on the, on the session after we've ended. So if you have any questions about anything you've missed, feel free to hold on to your questions 
um, if you want to ask after the web session's ended. Okay, uh, so I'm going to go over to my properties here and I'm going to choose auto size equals yes. And I'm going to drag this over here. And um, since now I have my logo on my form, I also want to use it to link to my home page by making the image clickable. And in the properties for my image, I have a property option called on click. The on click property allows me to assign an action to an object when it's clicked. And to make it clickable, I just click on the on click event and click on the ellipses here. And you see I have quite a few options. One of them is activate form. If I had multiple forms, I could use the on click property to switch between forms. But in this situation, I want to click on the hyperlink. And you can either double click to move it over, or you can click on the plus sign. So I'm going to go ahead and add the URL down here. And click OK. And then also, um, I want to let the users know that this is a, um, a clickable, clickable object, so I need to change the cursor property. So I'm going to go up here and change this to a hand point. So now when they hover over it, it changes. So let's go ahead and commit this and test it out. And now when I click on it, it should take us to the eVisions website, which it does. Perfect. Okay. So now what we want to do is put a title on our form, and I'll do that by clicking on the letter A button. Um, the A button creates a static label, and I'll click on the form. And once in the form, here are all the properties I can modify for this text label. And let's change the font size to 18. Now you have a few options here. You can actually, uh, you see you have the individual properties here, so I can just click here and change this to 18. Or I can click in here and click on the ellipses and kind of uh, do it all at once here. So I'm going to change the font to Arial. And I will change the color to white. And now to change the text of the object itself, I can do it in the property text box, or I can double click on the object itself. And we'll change the text to address list. And I'll just move this up here. And now you see we have our title. All right, so any questions right now? All right, so now I want to get started by adding my search parameters into my form. Uh, but remember when I added the title, I had to change the font and the size from the standard font defaults, and I really don't want to have to do that for every label and object that I add to the form. So I'm going to add a panel control to my form to alleviate that issue. The panel control does two things. It allows me to group objects, and it also, <clears throat> excuse me, it also allows me to set font property defaults for those objects that are placed on the panel. Now the panel control is the button that looks like a box with a couple of squares in it. And if I click on it, um, it's this one right here. I'm trying to get the little description to come up. And it doesn't. For some reason it's not coming up. There it is. So it says draw a panel. Um, so the um, 
I'm not going to click on it right now because um, I'm going to retrieve it from the library of objects. The library of objects is the same library that you saw in the report writer training and I can use it to add um, data block objects to the library as well as retrieve objects. So I'm going to um, click on the book icon to get to the library. Now as you notice there's two icons. Here's insert objects from the library and here's if I want to add to the library. So I'm going to retrieve from the library. And I'm going to grab the panel object and click OK. So here is my already formatted panel object. And um, this is really going to save me a lot of time because I'm adding in one object that's already configured with all of my standards. So as you can see, the color of the panel is already set to white. Panel white is the name of the variable. <clears throat> And um, the font is set to Arial, and font size is 10. OK, so now we're ready to add some more objects to our form. The first parameter I want to add is a date control, since I might want to search for addresses with a certain date. I'll add my label for my parameter first by using the text objects. Object, sorry. So first I'm going to add the label and I'm going to name this as of date. Now I'm ready to add my first edit control and I'll add in a date control which is the button with the little calendar page on it. Now, um, also I want to align the object with my label, so I'm going to use the alignment tools and I will align them by their center. And I also want to change the default today property to yes. Now users will still be able to change the date, but it will default to today's date. Um, one other thing I want to do is change the variable name. This is really important because once you get a few variables placed on the form, it does get difficult to distinguish between date edit one, date edit two, etc. So you might want to consider creating a naming convention. Here at eVisions, we use the abbreviation PARM or PARM for parameter, DT for date, and then a description for the object. So for instance, I'm going to use as of date. <clears throat> So for this one, I will call it P-A-R-M, D-T, as of date. And there it has defaulted to today's date. Everything looks good. Okay, <clears throat> so now we've added our first, first search parameter and we're going to move on to the next one. Um, in banner, addresses can be for either people or companies, so I want to add that to my form as a search parameter. So first I'll add my label. And I'm going to change the text to entity type. And the control I'm going to use for this one is a drop-down box, which restricts users to only one choice. Now, in this case, it's going to be people or companies. The drop-down box is the icon with the drop-down arrow on the right-hand side. And I'll go ahead and align these. I'm not going to spend too much time um, with the alignments. I just want to really make sure that you are aware you hit the shift key to grab anything you want to align and that um, 
you use the alignment tools uh, to make them look pretty and align them up there. If you have any questions, feel free to ask about that. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and rename the variable. Trust me when I tell you, you'll thank yourself. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm so sorry. You'll thank yourself later if you get into the habit of renaming these. Okay, so I'll go ahead and rename this Parm DD for drop down and entity type. Okay. Now I need the selections in my drop down box, and to add those, I'm going to click on the choices property. Um, you you have two choices for this. You can either double click in the object or you can click on the choices ellipses just so you know there's two ways to get into there so I can either create a list from a SQL statement or type it in manually since I have only two choices to enter I'll do a manual entry and click next I know the choices in banner are either C or P for entity type so I'll type those in as my choices Okay, I'm going to go ahead and add a row. Now, my users don't necessarily know what C and P mean, so I'll add in another column uh, with the description by using the blue plus sign for add column. I'm going to give my column a name. <clears throat> And this will be company, and this will be person. So now I have the entity code, which I will use in my query, and I have a description that the users can select to make their choice. But before I leave this window, I want to change the name of the main column. Each column is a variable I can use in my SQL code, and main doesn't mean anything for our purposes, so I'll change the name of the column to code by clicking on Edit Column. Oops, wrong one, sorry about that. And I'm going to change this to code. Okay, and click Next. So now um, I need to choose which column I want to display to the user. And I want to choose Description and click Finish. And now we'll commit it and test it. And here we have Company and Person. Okay. So the next control uh, we want to look at is I want to allow my users the ability to search by address types. So this time I want them to be able to make multiple selections. Remember the drop down only allows one. Now the control box I want to use for this is the list box. So first I'll add my label for my search control box. We'll align these guys by their left. And, <clears throat> and this one will be um, address, address types. Whoops, too many S's. There we go. And now I'll add in my list box. The list box is the icon that looks like a list and it has a scroll bar on its side. And we're actually going to align these two. Let's see, there we go, that's a little bit better. And we'll rename the variable. We'll do parm. 
LB for list box and address type. So I also need to change the multi-select property on this to yes. This will allow my users to make multiple selections from this box. And I have to create my selections list. And this time I'm going to double click on the object to get to my choice entry wizard. And since there are many um, address types, I don't want to have to type them all in manually. And if they change, I don't want to have to go back and update this control. So this time I'm going to choose the SQL statement object to create my selections list. And click Next. Now at this screen, I could type in my SQL query if I wanted to, but I don't have to do that. I can build my code using the Visual Designer. So I'll click on the ruler and pencil icon down here on the left-hand side. Um, this will um, get me to the Visual Designer. Okay, so I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Visual Designer here, but um, it's pretty cool. Um, this is the SQL build query tool, which is the visual design editor, and it will help create my SQL code for me. I just have to tell it what I want. I can use the buttons up here to um, show tables, or I can just click on the add table button if I know the exact name of the table. Uh, I would use the show table show tables button with caution if you are in banner banner can have over 3000 tables and that will take quite a long time to generate the view now my tabs down here are what um, where i build the select and conditional parts of my sql query for the demo today i happen to know which table i want so i'm just going to click on add table Okay, so um, I'm going to type in STVATYP. And okay. This is the validation table uh, that contains my address types. And I'll click OK. OK. So now you can see all the available columns in the table, and I'll choose the columns that I want to put in my list box. Just like with my entity type control box, I want to select the code and the description. I'll use the code when I build my query, and I'll use the description to show my users. And I can select my columns by clicking and dragging the variable down to my select tab, or I can double click to select as well. So I can double click, or I can click and drag. So um, in this instance, I don't have to filter my selection in my WHERE clause since I want all the information returned. But I do uh, want to sort the information that is returned. So for now, I'm going to skip the conditional fields tab and go directly to the ordering tab. And I want to sort by my description, not the code. So I'm going to go ahead and double click on the description. And I'll keep the default of ascending, and now my SQL select statement is complete. And now I'm back to the choice entry window, and you can see that the SQL code that the visual designer has created. And if I click on edit visual design, right here, I'll go back into the visual design, but if I want to go into what we call free type, where I can edit the SQL directly, I click on the edit SQL text link. So here you see we get this warning. The warning message says that if I want to edit the SQL directly, I cannot go back to the visual designer. So it's kind of like a you know, 
all or nothing here. Um, so I'm going to click no. And I'm going to click no to get out of the, uh, that window. And then I'm going to just click next. And here we have um, the query has returned two columns, the code and the description. And then just like my single choice drop down box, I can pick a column to show to the users. And I want description. And I'll click finish. And then let's commit it and see how it turned out. So here we have our entity type. And then I always like to double check that we can multi-select when we're supposed to be able to multi-select. Because sometimes you'll forget you know, to um, enable that multi-select property. Everything looks good. Okay, um, so now I want to add some more advanced search parameters. I want to allow the users to search by a last name or part of a name. And to do that, I can add an edit box. This allows users to enter in search data. And like all my other control boxes, the first thing I'll do is create a label. I'll put that up here. And now I'll add in my control by clicking on the edit box button, which is the icon that has the AB I-beam, and then clicking on the panel to add it. And let's see, so the, again, we want to change the variable name. EB for edit box and last name. Now the other property option I want to change is the required property. I want to change that from yes to no. Now this is different from my other parameters. The other parameters are required parameters, so the users have to enter in data to run the query. I don't want the users to be forced to enter in data in this search box, so that's why I changed it to no. I want to add another way for the users to narrow down their search by including or excluding inactive addresses. So I can use a simple checkbox for that. A yes include inactive addresses or a no does not include inactive addresses. So I'll add a checkbox control for that. The checkbox icon has a check on it and I'm just going to drop it on the panel. And I'll change the variable name. CV for checkbox. Inactive addresses. And I also want to change the text. Oops, over here. We want to change that to include inactive addresses. And then we want to stretch that out. Okay, so there's other things we have to change here too. We need to change the checked value to Y to indicate yes. Checked value up here, we want to change that to a Y. So when I include this variable in my SQL query, I'll use the Y to indicate that I want to include inactive addresses and a null to indicate that I don't want to include inactive addresses. Now lastly, I'll add a memo box for a comment section and a label called comment. The memo icon is the icon that looks like a letter and it's useful for either displaying large amounts of text or for allowing the user to add in multiple lines of text. So first I'll do my label. Uh, 
and we'll call this comments. And let's grab our memo. Okay. MB for memo box. Okay, now we also have a read-only property for this control, which defaults to no. Here we have the read-only property. Now, this allows users to enter in text. You might want to use this type of control to allow users to enter in comments that are included in reports. If you have complex directions or instructions that you want to display to the user, you could set the read-only property to yes, so that users cannot modify the text in the box. So um, now that we have our search parameters, I need to build our report query. So the report query, um, I want to return both the name and the address information from my query, and since we're working with transactional banner, I am going to need two tables. I happen to know the tables I need. The first table is the name information table, and it's called Spryden. So I'm going to click on Add Table. And all the address information is in this Spratter table, so I'll add that as well. Okay, so I now have the two tables I need in my designer window, and notice that there is a line connecting the tables. That line indicates that there is a join, and when I click on it, you can see the join. Now, if we look at our SQL by clicking on View SQL, Note the WHERE clause has been added for us. We're not forced to add it. And the JOIN came in automatically because I'm using the data dictionary. If you see here, this is highlighted, use a dictionary. The data dictionary is a series of aliases and JOINS which define the tables. The dictionary is customized by each institution, so you can add your own JOINS and aliases. Having the data dictionary with standard aliases makes things a lot easier for report writers because field names are the same between all the different data blocks. Now, we can decide whether we want to use the dictionary or not by clicking or unclicking the Use Dictionary button right here. So what I'm going to do is actually delete the join. And um, I can create my own join between the tables by clicking on a field in one table and dragging it to a field in the second table. And I'm going to join the PIDMs. If it wants to let me do it. All right, let's see here. There we go. There we go. You have to get that little circle with the line through it. Sometimes it's a little tricky. Okay, so now I have my new join, and if I click on the join, you see here you have your um, left field and right field indicated, 
and um, I can modify it or even add it to the dictionary. There are two ways to add it to the dictionary as a suggestion or as a contribution. You see that down here. A suggestion is a dictionary item that will need to be reviewed and approved by an administrator. A contribution will be added directly to the dictionary so everyone will be able to use it immediately. Now, as a side note, um, there are certain uh, privileges or permissions rather. Some users are able to immediately make contributions. Everyone can make suggestions. So uh, if you try to make a contribution and you're not able to, you would want to check with your administrator to see um, how you're able to do that. But everyone can make a suggestion. OK, so let me go ahead and close out of that. Um, so there's one more join to look at. Uh, we have this little nub right here. And um, this is a join that's actually working to identify the active sprite and record. In Banner, the sprite and table has a record for every individual. This includes inactive and historical records. We typically only want the most recent active record. To remove the other records from the result set, we have to filter on the sprite and change indicator field. So this join has been added to the dictionary, so it's automatically added to our query. And um, so let me close this. And here we have, let's go to View SQL. So as you can see, we have the where and the and sprite and change indicator is null has already been added, even though it's not on the where tab. So OK, so let's get started on filters based on the variables we built on the rest of the form. All right, um, so we're going to start with our select statement and choose the information we want to return in the report query. I'll do that by double clicking on the fields that I want in the table and adding them to my select tab. For my sprite and table, I'll choose ID and last name, first name, and Entity and from Spratter, we want from date as well. And we want city and state and zip and status. OK, now since we're using the dictionary, the fields came down with the aliases already described, but we can change them if we want. We recommend that these remain the same just as best practice. These names are what the Argos report writers see when they're creating reports. Now normally I wouldn't try to work with multiple conditions at once. I would add in a condition, test it, and then edit the query to add in my next condition. But this is a training situation and we want to move things along a little bit faster. So we're going to start with our from date variable and compare it to the banner data field. Um, since we want the dates for the addresses to be less than or equal from the date entered by the user, the banner field I need to use is the spreader from date. So let's see here. Now when I select the field, I can see the dictionary description at the bottom of the table, right here. Um, to add it to my where clause, I'm just going to double click on the field. And now I have the field, but I have to build the condition. I'll do that in the condition field. I can type my operator and condition right here in the condition row, or I can click on the ellipses to get to the SQL editor. I can type my condition here, and I have a few buttons to help me do this. So if I click on the ABC right there, I get a list of all the variables in my data block. And if I click on the radio button, I get a list of all of the fields in my tables. 
Um, so I want my banner data to be less than or equal to my date variable. So my condition is less than or equal to. And I click on my ABC button to pull in my variable. So here's the ABC button and I'm going to choose the uh, Parm date as of date. So it's already built that for me and now I have my condition and I can click OK and it's added it in there for me. And now the next variable we have is the entity parameter so we'll add that in. And let's see, so we want the sprite and entity right here. And we want our banner data to equal our variable. So first we'll directly type in the equal sign. And then click on the ellipses to build our condition. Actually, let me click off of there. There we go. Now notice that we need to expand the um, Parm DD entity type variable to select our code because remember we've got code and description. Okay. Uh, next is the address type code, so we'll want to add that in and build our condition. So we want the spratter A type code. Equals and the ABC. And again, we're going to expand the Parm address type and select code and select OK. And next we will add our advanced search parameters. I want to treat our last name slightly differently than our other conditionals. I don't want the search to be case sensitive and I also want the search to be, um, I want to search by using part of a name. So I'll use the SQL function lower to convert both the banner field data and the user's entered data to lowercase. I also have to add in a wildcard to do this. Um, so if I just add in the variable like I did previously, I won't be able to modify it because this field is static. So I'm going to go ahead and um, I need to fix that by creating a calculated field by manually clicking on the and or field. So I'm going to choose and here. Now notice it says calculated now in the table. So let's see here. So in my field field, I'm going to click on the ellipses to get to my SQL editor. And this is where I'm going to free type in the Oracle lower function. And I'm going to go to my blue radio button to pull in my sprite and data field. And choose last name. And close my parentheses. And click OK. So now that my database data has been converted to lowercase, the next thing I want to do is build my condition for my variable. And I'll click on my ellipses in my condition field. And in my SQL editor, I'll use like instead of the equal sign. Now again, I have to convert my variable data to lower, just like I converted the banner data, so I'll type in lower. And 
I'll click on ABC. And let's get the palm, edit box, last name. And now I have to add in my wild card. So I'm going to use pipes to concatenate my variable to the wild card, which is tick percent tick. And close parens. I think that looks right. Okay, um, so we still have another parameter to enter. That's the checkbox parameter for the status indicator. And that is not a simple and statement like the others because it requires an or. The checkbox is checked or the checkbox is not checked. So we have to add in another conditional group to only compare the results of the checkboxes. To add in a new conditional group, Click on the plus sign and build the conditionals just like before. So down here on the bottom left corner, we have this plus sign. And I'll add in my status indicator from the spreader table. Let's see here, so we need the spreader status indicator. And the condition for the status indicator is null. So we're gonna type in is null in the condition field. Now note that I didn't have to go into my SQL editor to build the condition. I can always type directly into that condition box. Now my next condition is calculated because I'm not using a database field, just the variable from the form. So for this, I'll use an or instead of an and. So let's see, Parm checkbox inactive. And the condition I'm going to build for my condition for this is, let's see. equals yes okay so let's view our sequel Okay, and we'll commit. And test. And fill in the variables. I'm just gonna select everything there. And I'll type in a lowercase w here. Now, so notice that I have a window at the bottom here with a get button. Um, this window will be populated with the results from our query and I'm gonna go ahead and click the get button. Okay, now um, if I scroll up and down in the results window, here are the addresses with the last name starting with a uh, W and we have no inactive addresses over here. So. 
after I um, click on the checkbox to include inactive addresses, let's see what happens. And click get. Now we have two inactive addresses. So the last thing I want to do is go back and order my results. So let's go back to the ordering tab. I'm going to close out of here and go to order by. And let's order by last name and first name. So we'll order by Sprite and last name and first name. That's all I need to do for that. So let's commit that and test it. And hit get. Everything looks good. Now I can also change the number of records returned by changing the max number of records returned right here in this little window here. So if you want to test your query without it having, um, you know, returning millions of rows, you can modify this option here. Um, so let's say I only want this to have five. Okay, so there's also another option uh, that a lot of our users like to have, and that is the option of returning the results um, on the data block form. They want the results of the report query up here on the form. And to do that, I'll use a multi-column list box, which is the icon that looks like it has two columns. So let me close out of here. We'll go to form design. So right here. This is our multi-column list box. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that and click on the form. And I'm going to drag it to fill up the whole space. Um, you want to make sure that it's large enough to return your results. I'm going to change the variable name. MC for multi-column results. And now that I have an area to return my results, I have to build the query. However, since our form query will be built exactly the same way as our report, I'm going to copy our report query over to our form query and just modify it slightly. So to do that, I'm going to go back to the report query build wizard. And now I will copy the SQL from within the Visual Designer. So I can just click the Copy button to copy the SQL. And then I'll go back to the multi-column list box on the Form Design tab. And you, all you have to do is just double click in that object. Go to SQL Statement, click Next, click into the pencil click paste, and here you have the exact same query. So now we're back into the um, choice entry window. So now you have to click OK. And we do have to um, go through all the same steps, obviously, to validate the query. So we're going to click Next. Um, we don't have to enter anything here. We can just click OK. We didn't get any errors, so click Finish. Now, um, if you don't click Finish, you won't save any of the SQL, and your SQL has to be correct for you to save it. So let's go ahead and commit and test. So we'll go ahead and click Person and select. All. Now notice, as soon as I selected all, something populated here. So let's go ahead and do our W. And it changed again when I hit um, get here. So notice that it runs every time I modified a parameter. We want to run the query just once, not every time I make a change. To, so to resolve this, we're going to add an action button. And um, 
so we're going to go back into the multi-column list box and we're going to modify the query. So we're going to go back into edit visual design. First, wait. First, we have to add the button onto the form. Sorry about that. <laughs> Got ahead of myself. Um, so first, we're going to add the button. The button is the little icon that has the go on it. So first, we'll add the go onto We'll put it over here. OK. Um, so we want to, the button, um, the button's going to run the query when it's clicked. And the button, uh, I want to click the button. I want it to say um, what it's, obviously, I want the users to know what the button's going to do. So we'll change the text. And we're also going to change the name of the variable. So here we will have this say parm. BT, we'll say it, run query. Okay, and then also we're going to change the caption instead of just button. We'll have it say um, run query. Okay, that's better. Okay, so now I'm ready to modify the query to add in the variable. So now we'll go ahead and double click in here. And we will go into the where tab. And all I have to do is add a calculated condition that my parm bt run query must not be null. So we're just going to click on and. We'll leave that at calculated. We're going to grab the parm bt run query. Is not null. And we'll save our changes. Okay, and now let's commit it. Okay, so now nothing should populate in the multi-column list box until after I've entered all of my parameters and clicked the Run Query button. So notice nothing populated yet. Let's include and then Run Query. So that's how that works. So far, so good. OK, so next, uh, we're actually almost done with this part of the training. <laughs> Thanks for hanging in there with me. I know this is a very long training. Uh, so we also have the option of returning a count of our results on the data block form. And to do that, we have to create a SQL variable and build the query. Now, SQL variables are fields that contain SQL statements created by the user that do not reside on the parameter form. In the variables tab, SQL variables are called user variables. So let's close out of here, and we're going to the variables tab. Um, SQL variables can also be used to update, insert, and or delete from a table in a database. Since our count query will be built exactly the same way as our form query, I'm going to copy our multi-column list box query to our SQL variable query and modify it slightly. But before we create our SQL variable, let's add a label for our count. So I'm going to go ahead and add a label for the count. I'll put that up here. And now let's put this down here. Makes more sense. It'll be record count. And now I'm going to copy the SQL from the visual designer. And I can click the copy button to copy the SQL. So again, we're going back in here. And we're clicking Copy. And now I just have to uh, click um, on the Variables tab. Click on the blue plus sign to add the variable to the list. 
And we will use a SQL statement, so we're just going to leave that uh, SQL statement radio button selected. Select the ruler and pencil icon to go into the visual designer. And we're going to paste the query. Now I'll modify our query to get the count. We're going to go ahead and remove all of the fields but the sprite in ID field from the select statement by clicking on the blue X. So we're going to remove everything except the sprite in ID, which is the very first one. Now we have to click on the summing icon to get our count in the summing field right here. We'll click on the drop down and select count. And we're also going to change the alias to record count. Okay, so now we're also going to rename our SQL variable. Let's rename it uh, SQL record count. Now to add our count to our form, we need to create a data aware label. The data aware property allows variable data to be used in place of static text for labels, edit boxes, memo fields, and date edit objects. When an object, when an object <coughs> excuse me, has the data aware property set to yes, the text property becomes a drop down list from which the user can select the data, select the data field. The drop down list includes all of the data block variables and SQL variables for this data block. So we're going to go ahead and add our label and set the data aware to yes. And in the text field, we're going to select our uh, count SQL variable. Okay, so let's commit this and test it. So as you see, we have a record count of 21 and there's 21 items in the multi-column list box. Okay, so we are finished with that part of the training. Now we're going to move on to the designer capabilities, uh, which will go through the um, templates, scheduling, and security and revision control. So let's see here. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close out of here then. Okay. So, um, now we're going to be discussing your, the capabilities of a data block designer. And as a data block designer, um, now you're able to use pretty much all the buttons. We can um, cut, copy, paste, delete, import, export, share to the co-op, uh, manage security, access the library of objects, and go to the co-op, the support site, and the in-product help. Now, some of these icons are gray, and that's because they're only available in specific situations. So if we take a look at the co-op, let me go ahead and click on that. 
it will ask you to sign in. And this is a place for the client community to share data blocks. It's a great place to go when you're creating your first data blocks. There are hundreds of data blocks available for download. And after you've created some of your own, you should really consider sharing them with the community. Um, instead of trying to like reinvent the wheel, I do highly recommend that you check the co-op because there are some users that have been around since like the beginning of Argos that have created some really amazing stuff. And then there's also uh, data blocks that eVisions has uploaded as well. So I would definitely go on here if you're looking for something and see if someone hasn't already created something. And then you can always modify it typically to suit your needs. Um, so for example, let's say you're looking for a class roster data block to import into Argos. So if I just search for class roster, so here's one here, let's see, I'll do, I'll do this one. Let's just say here, it gives you some screenshots. It'll usually also give you a description. It'll tell you what versions you have to be on. Um, and then to download it, you just click on download. Now, so let's say I'm, I'm not actually going to download this file right now. So back in Argos, um, let's say I have you know, found one that I want to download. You want to import this new data block that you just downloaded. So you click on the folder that you want to download that uh, data block into and you click on import. So for example, this class roster one, I click open and you're given these options. So let's say the one that you found, you don't need all of those reports. You really just need the one banded report. So you uncheck these. You might want the quick view. And then you also have the option of retaining the revision history, the original author and dates, and then you click import. So here you have your roster plus those um, other reports that you decided to pull in, and then here you have the original notes as well. It's actually that easy. Now, so uh, notice also as a designer over on the tile over here, um, you have additional actions. You can edit, which allows you to edit the data block. You can edit the data, which will allow you to access the object XML. You can delete. Um, which we're going to discuss a little bit later and also with security we'll be discussing later and then share which allows you to upload to the um, co-op. Now to export a data block, let's say, for example, let's just stick with the class roster. In the exporting window, uh, so you click on the one you want to export, click on export. For example, if you're working with one of us here on the help desk and we ask you for um, an export of your data block, you just click on export. Again, you're going to choose which reports underneath that that you want to export with it. Um, you choose where you want it to go. And then also something that's very important, let's say you're exporting just from one server to another, from prod over to test. This is very important uh, if you used save settings and um, in your OLAPs as well, you're going to want to check these two boxes. Otherwise, your saved dashboard settings and saved OLAP settings will not go with it. So your users will be irate if you do not save these uh, in the export with it. And then you'll click OK. It'll tell you it's finished. And then you just click OK and it's been exported. Um, okay, so that's it for importing and exporting. So now we're going to go over scheduling. And um, 
The schedule and delivery module allows you to automate the running of a report and also assign tasks to the schedule as well. So we're going to take a look here at, say, this banded report. And um, to schedule a report, all you have to do is highlight the report that you want to schedule, and you click on the Schedule button. It's under here on the Data Block Designer tile. Click on Schedule. Now here we have different tabs here. So on the general tab, I can check or uncheck the active button, which activates or deactivates the schedule. It will default to active. Um, as a rule of thumb, I usually deactivate it while I'm configuring it, just until I make sure that I have it set to how I want it, and then I go back and I activate it. That's just something that um, I do. You can do whatever you want. So then we go to the schedule tab. And this is uh, where you set up the timing and frequency of when the schedule will run. You can also configure schedules to run only during specific time ranges. Here we have the Tasks tab. The Tasks tab allows you to select what actions you want to take when the schedule runs. Um, you've got a ton of different options here. Uh, the most common is probably send an email. Now you're going to notice here that at a minimum you need two tasks and these are always going to be there uh, when you create a schedule. Execute the report and process and save. The process and save, just to elaborate a bit, um, the save part of the task name refers to saving the report for the scheduling process to use while it's running. A hard copy file of the report is not actually saved anywhere. So um, from the output format, I can print the report or decide on an output format, but I can't tell the task where to put the file. I can just decide on the format of the file and that's it. I, I need to add a copy file task to the task list in order to configure where a file will actually be saved. So a note about the variable names right here. The variable names are used by all the other tasks in the scheduler and they default to process file name and process file ext. The file name variable stores the name of the output file while the file extension variable stores the default file extension as determined by the report type and selected output format. So if you change these variable names in this task, you have to make sure that you change it in all the other tasks. And if you don't, then the other tasks are not going to be able to find the files. So generally speaking, again, best practices, we recommend that you keep the default variable names unless you have some compelling reason to modify these. Uh, that's one of the very first things that we check when we're troubleshooting a ticket is we go in here and we see if these have been modified in some way. Now, as of version 5.4, when you're configuring a scheduled report to produce PDF output, you also now have access to a full range of PDF options in the process and save task. So these were previously only available when saving a report manually. So you can now click on the options button and you now have a full, um, full PDF set up here. Okay, so let's cancel out of here and go to the events tab. Um, so the events tab allows you to send an email on success and or failure of the schedule. This is something I cannot stress enough that I highly recommend uh, whether you are the designer or whether you're going to have your user set up schedule. I highly recommend that you always, when you're setting up a schedule, set up an on error email event. That way, when you configure the on-error email event, you have it um, send to yourself, whomever else, and then in the subject line, you say, you know, uh, schedule errored out, because when you get the on-error email event, you'll get an email, and in the body of the email, Argos and Maps will tell you why it errored out. And that's very important when we're trying to troubleshoot with you, so you've submitted a ticket, hey, my schedules are failing, I don't know why, we're starting with at square one, but if you've received an email, an on-error email event with an error message in the body of the email and it's saying access denied or some other reason, um, we already have somewhere to start. 
and that's really 90% of the battle. Um, so we can just say, oh, you know, is this, you know, was there, um, did the folder get moved or something like that? So that's very important um, when you're setting up a schedule. And um, what, okay, so then we've got the API tab. So the API tab is for administrators to set up API calls. If you need to do that, you would have to be an Argos administrator. And then, um, so once it's all scheduled, you click OK. Oh, let's see. So this is in the past, so let's change this to, it's 10.24, we'll change this to 11. So you see I just had a warning that the next scheduled date was in the past. That was them letting, Argos letting me know. Okay, so now we have our schedule has been created. So under the scheduler actions, you have three options. Edit, delete, and run schedule now. Edit allows you to edit the schedule. Delete will delete the schedule. And run schedule now, this is new as of version 5.4. This executes the schedule immediately as though its next scheduled date were the current time. Running the schedule now has no effect on the next scheduled date of execution. So that's a brand new feature. Okay, so now we're going to move on to security. I think I'm a few slides behind here. Oh no, good, okay. <laughs> so uh, for security. Um, remember that security is inherited. Child objects inherit their security properties from their parent unless it is specifically modified at the child level. Security can be modified at the folder level, the data block level, report, or field level. The most common way to implement security is at the folder level because it's the easiest to maintain. Now let's go back to Argos. And uh, let's see here. So to modify security on a folder, you simply highlight the folder and click on the security button. And um, you can either click on it in the detail pane or on the toolbar. Let me just show you. You also have the option to right click and go to security there. Now, so <clears throat> you can select the group or user that you want to add. So you can click add. You choose the group or user. So let's say I want to add this user, click OK. And now you can modify the allow or deny permissions of the group or user that you added. Um, Argos allows data block designers to modify security, but it is a permission that must be granted by the MAPS administrator. Now, as discussed in the report writer training, security can be modified at the field level, and we will review this in the data block that we've been working on with all the other uh, previous trainings. So let's go back to Argos. Okay, so you see we have the key icons right here. There's the security key and then each field has its own security key as well. The key icon allows us to modify security for all the fields in the select statement. And um, here you see we have a key next to last name because the security has been modified. So if I click on last name, you see the groups and users section has everyone and HR. We've got everyone and HR. So you see here that everyone permissions says read deny, human resources says read allow. Now um, this means that human resources would be able to see the last name and everyone else is going to be blocked. So I want to look at an example of this. So we're going to go ahead and close out of here. And we're going to run the banded report. Uh, 
Now notice that the last name column returns blank. And that's because I'm not part of the human resources group. We're moving on to revision control next. Okay. So um, one thing about revision control, it is, a, I think, a very underutilized feature in Argos. And if more people used revision control, I think um, it would be very helpful because we do get uh, many tickets regarding um, how can I recover a, a revision of a data block, someone made a change, and I want to go back to an older version. And um, if they were just using revision control, that would have resolved the issue. So. Revision control allows you to maintain a version history of your data blocks and reports along with a record of each version's author and notes. Revision control provides a system for creating and managing multiple versions of data blocks and reports, and essentially it allows you to make and save changes to a report or data block without having to worry about overwriting the previous version. You know, obviously, everyone has to be on board with it, though. So um, to set revision control, I'll show you how to do this here. Uh, you simply go to the folder data block or report where you want to set revision control and you right click on the object and select revision settings. So I'm going to show you on this same data block here. Here we have revision settings. So right now it's set to no. And here I can enable revision control for the object and its children. The default setting is no, and just so to enable it, I'm going to go ahead and click yes. And then we can also select the maximum number of revisions to store. I'm just going to leave it at two. And then when we go to edit the data block, and we make a change, so I'll just make a simple change. I'll change the button text. And I'll commit it. So notice now, instead of just saving it, I have this, this window here, revision control, and it's asking me, um, do I want to overwrite the change, the revision, or do I want to change it as a new revision? So what I want to do is I want to make this the active revision, and I'm going to put a note in here with what I did. I'm going to say changed button text from Oh, I forget what it said now. <laughs> I'll say change button text to run query. I really should say what it was, though. To run query. That's my bad. Okay. And I should put the date. Okay, so I'll click OK. And I made this the active one. And I'll close it. So now, any time, um, now at any time, you can manage the revisions for the object. So what I'm going to do now is go back to, so now remember, before there was not this option to manage revisions. So I'm going to go into revisions. So now, you see, this has been made the uh, active revision. Change button text to run query. Oh, it said return results. <laughs> um, the star indicates that this is the active version. Uh, so let's say I wanted to um, go back and change this. I would just simply click the star. This will now be the active revision. I can delete this one. Um, I can make an edit to it. So. Um, 
So yeah, the revision control has saved people from having to roll back their entire system just to get one data block back. And you do not want to have to roll back, trust me, that is a huge hassle. Okay, actually that's, that's the end of the training. If you have any questions, of course, you're always welcome to submit a help desk ticket. And then I hope everyone has a fantastic day and thanks so much for attending.